Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your panel on Investing in Volatile Markets, moderated by Bloomberg's Manus Cranny. Ladies and gentlemen, we are your obstruction to a cocktail. <laughs> So with that in mind, uh, we're going to discuss investing in volatile markets. My name is Manus Cranny. I'm part of the Bloomberg uh, editorial team here in the Middle East. We've got a cracking panel for you. We've got Todd uh, Bowley, CEO and chairman of Eldridge, Amanda Staveley, CEO of PCP, Joshua Harris, Apollo Global, and Mike Novogratz. This is a frisky panel, I can tell you that. We've had a little, <laughs> we've had a little bit of a chat before we came on, so hopefully you're going to enjoy it. Uh, and, and we'll take a few questions near the end. The title of tonight's panel is Investing in Volatile Markets. So let's take it to you, Mr. Novogratz, because you know a thing or two about volatile markets, from the gains to pain, from $19,000 to $4,000 in cryptocurrencies. Volatile markets, this, these aren't really that volatile markets, are they? Well, listen, we had a uh, kind of a once-in-a-generational bubble in cryptocurrencies. It was a speculative mania. It came, it went. And it was a lot of fun if you were along. It wasn't a lot of fun if you didn't sell. Um, and in a lot of ways, you know, that's in the history, history books. Mm. Uh, and so people ask, well, it's, how does that translate to the rest of the world? When I look at the world right now, um, I think volatility is going to pick up some, but not a lot. Uh, you know, the U.S. economy is still doing fine. Uh, there will be $1 trillion of stock buybacks this year. A trillion dollars of stock buybacks. The Fed is on hold, given the market and the economy some support. Uh, and I think they're going to continue to be dovish. And so we're going to get volatility coming from politics. Uh, my, my intuition is sometime in the next eight weeks, Robert Mueller is going to dump a report <laughs> on the Congress and the Senate's desk that's probably going to be about six inches you know, wide, and it's going to... It's going to detail all the things that most of us have already heard about that you know, President Trump has done or accused of, from deceptions to lies to maybe crimes. I doubt he's going to indict him. And you're going to have this moment where Trump is going to say, fake news, don't look at the genie behind the curtain and move on. We either will. <clears throat> or the Republicans are going to say, now that we see it all so perfectly lined out in this case that Mueller makes, we're going to back away from him. And so I don't know which way it's going to go. That's going to create a period of volatility. And so I think most of this year, it's going to be economics okay, political, political volatility adding something to the market. Uh, and so it's a buy the dip market, uh, not stay long market. And when it rallies a lot, you can sell. Um, but, you know, banks are in really strong shape in America. I had a... Uh, uh, conversation with two CEOs and when, the, when we had the sell-off in November and they couldn't find a crack in the system. Uh, and so, you know, I'm really not worried. <clears throat> okay, so, so that's setting up the, the backdrop. Let, let, let's go to you, Joshua, because I talk every day about the length of this economic cycle. It keeps going. You're saying a trillion dollars in buybacks is, is one of the things supporting the equity side of the markets. But from a, a risk point of view, Mr. Krugman was with us yesterday, and he said he sees the possibility of a risk of a recession in 2020 as being the flick of a coin. How near the end of the cycle are we? Yeah, look, I would tend to agree that with uh, Mike that um, whenever there's a problem, the central banks are just throwing up. I mean, we saw it really in December also that we were shifting from a, a technically driven market that was driven by the wall of money to a fundamentally driven market. And... Um, but the, you know, some of the communication was flawed, and uh, people thought that the Fed was going to go too quickly. And you saw, you know, a massive, massive downdraft in the market, and they immediately corrected. And so, I think what you're going to see is uh, almost no matter what the volatility is, that you know, central banks have kind of a free free lunch. Uh, there's uh, low unemployment, but not yet inflation, and they're going to be very careful to not move too fast and to use the um, powers that they have, and I think Lehman and the last financial crisis, uh, crisis showed everyone that they'll throw enough, they'll throw enough money into the system to keep whatever happens muted. So, having said all that, um, 
you know, I think that the, um, if you look at the fixed income markets, uh, they're, they're implying about a 25% uh, risk of uh, recession uh, in 2020, and the equity markets are a bit higher. Actually, if you look at the S&P 500, um, the P net of, if you back out FANGs, uh, P is 13, and earnings growth is pretty good. So uh, that, that really does imply a much higher risk of recession. So, you know, my guess is, our guess is that, um, you know, after the election, I, I think President Trump uh, in the U.S. is certainly going to do everything he can to get elected. That'll probably mean cutting a deal with China at the right time and declaring victory. It'll probably be, mean, you know, doing a, as much as he can to uh, put a lot of pressure on the Fed not to move too quickly. Um, and there's, we don't, I don't really see an event out there, but at the same time, um, I think as an investor, you have to bake in, and I think it'll sustain through 2020, but I think that as an investor, you have to bake in that there's some kind of moderate dip. And so when we're you know, building our private equity scenarios, we're really looking at that kind of recession. Um, the yield curve, um, the 2.5 yield curve is now inverted a tiny bit. Uh, um, the last nine times that's happened, there have been a recession, nine of them. Uh, the central banks are trying to like uh, thread a really, you know, walk a very fine tightrope. Uh, so I'm not sure this will be any different. You're just going to have a, a bit, it's like the political business cycle. And, and so we'll see. I tell you, the trade war is hurting um, the U.S. but hurting China a lot more. Okay. Um, I don't, but, I, but, but like I said, I think uh, ultimately the U.S. will release the pressure on that. Um, and, and Europe, right, there's a lot of political instability, but at the same time, I think Italy, the UK, and everyone's figuring out, it's hard to leave the EC once you're in it. Um, there's real legal remedies and real costs. So you've had, you know, Greece, and then you had Italy, and now you're having the UK figure out, you know, the, the co it's easy to get elected and say you're gonna leave, uh, and, or you're gonna s spend or, you know, create social policies. Much harder to implement that when you've agreed to be in the EC and their international courts and your currency is part of the euro, and even when your currency is not part of the euro. So I think all of the risks that we all see out there that could create a recession uh, feel like they're all gonna mitigate, uh, but at the yep. same time, um, when you just look at the history of uh, an inverted yield curve, uh, the, the business cycle, uh, and what's occurred, you know, you have to actually probably bake that in. Okay. Amanda, can I bring it to you? You and I spent a little bit of time on the phone last night, and I, you, you talked about the kind of businesses that you are investing in at the moment. And what comes to my mind, are those investing on the back of your concern about an economic slowdown, and so you're looking at alternative assets? Is that part of your thinking? I think we, we look at alternative assets. I mean, I'm a private equity business, and I, you know, I can't really compete for, uh, val on valuation with some of the bigger private equity firms. So we've been looking for alternative asset classes for the last five years. We were looking in Greece for non-performing loans when, right. you know, you, about three years ago. Now, uh, you know, things are starting to, to uh, the infrastructure in Greece is starting to get a, a little bit more so that um, people can invest. But on an asset class, we're looking at, you know, um, commodities, we're looking at mining, we're looking at regional things, we're looking at, we've invested in litigation funding uh, because it's non-correlated and it's an interesting asset class for us, it's, it's new, uh, you get IRRs of, of, you know, 15 to 25 percent. Actually, you know, we've, we've seen uh, companies with 40 to 60 percent IRRs. So, I mean, our focus is, you know, we, we don't want to go into auctions and compete with are the big, the big boys because we're not going to win. You know, money is money, and if we can add some strategic advantage, mm -hmm. that's that's a good thing. Um, we've been looking at sport. I mean, I'm sure we'll talk. The, 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 we'll the, get to the there's sport. There's a lot of sport. We'll, we'll come sport, back on we? that one. Um, and uh, we've got um, uh, something else we've been doing in the UK, which is affordable. Looking at working with the UK government to. Uh, support affordable housing, where we can get much more longer dated cash flows, inflation protected, um, and that, that's sort of 125 year cash flows that we would never have done this type of business. It's quite a low, low margin, but we think someone you know, will buy those cash flows from us later. Can I bring it to you, uh, Todd? Evaluating, when we, were on, when we were chatting, you said, to me, Manis, 
it, it's about how do I evaluate the opportunities in dislocated markets in volatile times? What is the most important thing when you assess the volatile markets that we're looking at? So when we look at the businesses that we invest in or the asset classes, we try not to get confused between how do we pay for something and what are we buying. So a lot of the time we're spending is evaluating the underlying assets. So right now we're very big in secured lending. Mm -hmm. So we have a very big secured loan book, we have a very big equipment finance business, we have a triple net real estate lease business, and all of these are generally unlevered 7 and 8% returns. So we think that the volatility around being at the top of the capital structure, being secured, and even with intellectual property, and you know, we have a big movie and TV and film and live event business with Dick Clark, and all of these are cash flows that can become very predictable. And if we can get very predictable cash flows and then figure out how to purchase them at reasonable prices with moderate amounts of leverage, then we think we can compound over long periods of time in the double digits. And by being secured, you know, we can amp out the volatility because generally we're at the top of the capital structure or whatever the equivalent is. You've mentioned leverage and politics, uh, Mike. You, you mentioned politics. You've touched on leverage. So let's just dig a little bit deeper. On the leverage side, when we were sitting having a cup of coffee, you said, actually, Mike, what's going on in markets is an aggressive delevering in what the back, the back eighth of, of, of 2018. <coughs> yeah, right. U.S. equity markets have as low, low leverage as they've had in years. And so it's hard to see a giant capitulation from here. Right? Quite frankly, the opposite is easier to see. You get a China trade war. Uh, with a, with a trying to trade war coming to an end, uh, so Trump gets some points, you have a dovish Fed, and you could see an equity market melt up again. Because no one's, no one's expecting it, right? People are expecting the recession that's come because we've got nine years, and when is it going to come? <clears throat> and so the market's bearish. What's your perspective on leverage, Amanda? You're, you're, have, you're having meetings with people, you're talking to investors. Is there a desire to take leverage? I think, you know, the market is... I mean, the credit markets were, quite a lot of deals were actually getting done. I mean, obviously, recent deals have been priced much higher. I mean, uh, if you think about the new couple of deals last week. Um, you know, pre-Brexit, yeah, you're, you were 250, 300. You, but there are still, there's the debt markets, even though they've tightened, at least if you're on the credit side, you're getting paid a little more for your debt. Depends which side of the table you're, you're playing. For us, we're, we're private equity, so leverage is important. Um, but we also know that when we look at any business, we have to think where we're we going to sell this business. So if we, if we have something that's so tight and such a great deal <coughs> and we can't replicate it in five years or there isn't another alternative uh, credit buyer, uh, and we try to think about that, so mm -hmm. that's how leverage... Um, but the market is, is uh, needed to delever a little. I was just going to say, uh, the leverage finance markets are you know, wildly aggressive right now. So, um, you, know, the, you know, the bar is open, the bartender serving drinks. You can definitely drive, do drive off down the road. I mean, you saw uh, a retrenchment <laughs> of, if you want, right? And, you know, either you'll have an accident or you won't. Um, that's going to put upward pressure on private equity pricing. And that's what you're seeing. Uh, the average private equity transaction... Um, in 2018, got done at 11 times EBITDA. That would be the highest ever, including you know pre the financial crisis. Leverage statistics are um, mid fives, which doesn't seem as high, but uh, about uh, between 20 and 30 percent of EBITDA is adjusted EBITDA. So when you actually adjust those stats uh, for the cost savings and other things that private equity firms are baking in. You're more, you're closer to uh, six and a half or seven times leverage, and so, you know, you're seeing, you know, that you're seeing actually quite a. I mean, it's very hard as an investor right now in the private markets um, because you have, um, you know, kind of aggressive pricing in the private markets. You yeah. have lots of leverage, and you have the uncertainty around the economic environment. Those three things add up to a difficult, you know, situation. So, you, what you need to do is go after things that are dislocated. Okay. Um, stop. Hold, hold, hold that thought. Are you drink driving with leverage? <laughs> um, I don't drink, drink and drive. So. <laughs> it, sorry, I was drawing on the pump. He just drinks. 
in 2008, no. you know, you had a whole round of LBOs that got done, and Freescale was a perfect example. It was a semiconductor business that Blackstone took private. And, you know, at the time, it was a LIBOR plus 200 covenant light loan. It ended up getting repaid. It ended up getting repaid at par. So at the top of the capital structure, you're going to first watch pricing disappear. And then once pricing disappears, they start attacking the document. So they start, the banks start competing on whether the terms are going to get looser and looser. And that's a pendulum that swings back and forth. You know, in the end, from our point of view, you know, we see that as a business that you know, we can be in day in and day out. And occasionally, you'll have leverage creep up. But the 11 times multiple that Josh quoted also includes the synergies, too. So if it's five and a half times levered, you're looking at deals that are 50% senior financing, 50% junior financing, some form of high yield, and some form of equity, perhaps. But, you know, is the, uh, but the, at the end, the equity checks are getting bigger and bigger. So these guys have, the private equity firms have more and more at stake mm -hmm. in order to play through these things longer. That doesn't justify the fact that, you know, it's true that the credit markets kind of have that pendulum is swinging right now. You know, there's also two types of leverage in the world, right? There's term leverage that's cash flow based, which won't go away when the market collapses. Mm -hmm. And then there's mark to market leverage. One of the things we saw in the 08 crisis was there was a lot of mark to market leverage built up in the system. So there was all these, you know, market value CBOs and warehouses and they all had triggers and when the value of the collateral fell, all the triggers came due, and then they liquidated even more. So, of course, that pushed the, value, the, the prices down even further. You know, but literally, you know, within six months of that, the market came back and it was functioning. Okay, I want to go down the line. I want the biggest opportunity to protect yourself in a volatile market. You can choose any asset class that you want. In your own world, Amanda, Amanda Amanda's racking her brain there. But this is, this is about volatile markets, investing in volatile markets. So, so Sean, listen, I, I, I'm going to take heed with you for a second. Like, so last year, we had bear markets everywhere in, except the U.S. At the very end of the year, we had a bear market in the U.S. We, we came back and, you know, ended the year down. And so we had a really pretty bad, bad investing environment, right, with medium volatility. It wasn't a... Yep. crisis. We had one stint of volatility. I think, <clears throat> look at, China was the big loser last year in growth, right? The trade war hit China, China growth collapsed. So what's China doing? Right? He doesn't want to lose his control. China is doing a massive stimulus and a massive cutting rates. And so buy Chinese equities uh, right now. Chinese equities are going to go higher. Um, and so uh, the pessimism around the, the investing community, I think, is ill-founded. I get we're getting closer to the end of, end of the cycle, okay. and, but I think you know, it's still found. So I don't, I don't think you need to be so defensive. Okay, buy Chinese equities for, for, for my... <laughs> um, I'd say if you want 6 to 10% returns, I think you go off the run. Anything that has a QCIP that is uh, traded and that is rated in the fixed income world is overvalued because it's being uh, artificially... Uh, prices are being artificially inflated and, and rates are being artificially lowered by the central bank. So if you're in credit, you want to go out of, you want to go off the run into direct origination, middle market lending, aircraft leasing. You want to go with people that can add two to 400 basis points per unit of risk. So instead of making, you know, kind of four to six, you can make six to 10 for, you know, double B, triple B, single B type returns. If you're talking about private equity returns, um, you have to go into things that are dislocated and complicated. So uh, financial services, because of the low rates, insurance, banking is dislocated all over the world. There's a lot of regulatory pressure to sell businesses, sell assets to, for capital relief. Um, and so we're doing a lot of stuff in insurance and banking. Um, natural resources due to the, the oil price, you know, has destroyed the public equity markets in the U.S. And yet, the shale is actually quite competitive now with the best parts of the shale are you know, economic at $30. So natural resources is an area where you can buy okay. really cheap. And then other dislo ugly tech. There's a lot of tech out there that is bundled where you have mature commoditizing businesses that might be under attack by Amazon combined with um, you know, less mature, interesting technologies. These are, these are in public companies. And, and like I said, the vast majority of the market, the destruction of the value 
investor in the market and the hedge fund, right? 80% of the public equity markets today are, um, are, are basically quant or index. So if, you're, if you can buy cash flow cheaply in the public markets um, privately, if you can take it private, there's a real opportunity for uh, private equity. Private equity has become the arbiter you know, of the public markets. About 60% of our last one was public to private, which still made sense even though we were putting a premium on these public companies that were just not well traded. Amanda, for you. Um, I don't think I'm, you know, volatility is, is actually uh, our friend. We don't shy away from it. I think we, um, we see volatility in market. If I go back, to God, 10 years, 10 years is a long time. When we did the Barclays trade, the, the key driver of that, that deal for us was the, the warrants and, and the volatility drove those. So, we actually tend to go into markets when we think they're going to be quite volatile. I have, I have to also um, say that anything on the private equity, there's a lot of things coming off of as a, a certain amount of deleveraging is happening. So businesses that we can buy at four times, five times EBITDA um, are, are attractive. Where are we investing uh, privately and then exiting through the public markets now? Um, on, uh, gold, very much. We're, we're just uh, hopefully about to do our, our first transaction in, in gold in Asia, which is something that I would we'd not done before, but with a good, really exceptional management team. Um, and ending on management teams, you know, as an investor, the most important thing we look for is great people. We invest in people. Volatile, not volatile. Your key driver is, is your people. So, if you so it depends what you're looking for. If you're looking for kind of six to ten percent rates of return, then you know we've got a triple net leasing business that's publicly traded. It's called EPRT, and basically they go out and they buy real estate and 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 then enter into long-term leases and rental agreements with the businesses that they acquire the real estate of. So you end up owning the real estate, and then they take back a 20-year lease with the right to operate the real estate. And that right now is a, a nice business for us at an unlevered seven or seven and a half percent return. And it trades in the market at you know, five and a half. So every time we originate something, it goes up in value. And you know, we're seeing that with a stock that performed really well in December when the world was kind of cratering a little bit. It went public at 14 bucks a share. It's trading north of 16 now. But it's not, there's not a lot of leverage in it, and it's very predictable, but you're going to you know, get a very certain five and a half, six, seven percent rate of return. If you're going for something that you know, has higher rates of return, then you really have to go to places that are complex and dislocated. And right now, for example, with Major League Baseball, we're looking at buying the regional sport networks, and you know, we're creating something there at probably six times or so. And, uh, ultimately, we're very happy with that, what that looks like in order to generate much better rates of return. But again, you have to go to places that you know, are complex and have you know, terms that you know, aren't easy to, to wade through and have a lot of complexity around them. Mike, I want to I go back to China. Um, we talk on a daily basis about trade wars. Will there be a deal? Won't there be a deal? What will the stimulus be from the PBOC? Are we underestimating the strength of the PBOC in ballasting the Chinese economy? Because it's got consequences for every single investor in this room in terms of sentiment, in terms of public markets, <coughs> and in terms of confidence. You know, it's, it's a great question. And, you know, I, China's neighbor is Japan, and, you know, they've been holding up their fixed income market for 15 years now, rates are negative. Uh, what's been interesting in the lesson of Japan and of Europe and, and is that, and, and really it's the elephant in every room. When I was talking to the, the CEO of Citibank in Bank of America, and they looked through their whole bank and all their loans, they're like, the only elephant in the room is government debt, is governments have guaranteed everything. And since, since 08, right, leverage is at the all time high in the world. <laughs> But it's not consumer leverage, it's not business leverage, it's government leverage. And we don't know when people say flinch. And right now, no one's saying flinch. You know, Ten years in the U.S. are two and a half percent. They're negative in Germany, they're negative in Japan. And so, wait a minute, government is borrowed incessantly. 
yet no one cares. And, and China is kind of in the same spot. And so I, I think China's got the firepower. And, and, and this is a shitty answer, but it's got the firepower until it doesn't. Uh, and we haven't hit that Minsky moment in any of the major global fixed income markets. Um, and so I think you're going to see China attempt and solidify their economy. Uh, listen, they'll, they'll nationalize the bad loans like they always have. The, every government has a printing press, and um, they can ultimately monetize their own debt. So I think the Japan example, I, I don't know that it'll ever be, you know, kind of, I don't think people will call quits. I mean, ultimately, it demotivates, it creates certain behaviors that end up slowing the economy. But I think, I don't see, I think plus that China has three plus trillion of currency that they can play with. They have more than enough firepower, as they showed in the financial crisis, to power through this, I, I believe. I think the, the, I th to get through this and keep growing if they need to grow. So it's, you know, China is 40% of the world's growth. The U.S. is about 30% of the world's growth. The two countries are 70% of the world's growth. So it's really those two countries and the, and the relationship between those, those two countries that create you know, the GDP growth for all of the world. So I, I guess like that's what we all should be focused on. And I guess my answer would be more would be optimistic. And just to underscore what Mike said, it's not it's less volatile today than it has been on average over the last 10 years. It's just that we're all coming off of a period of zero volatility where there was a central bank put and now it's simply a neutral environment. It's neutral to bullish. And so we're just now, I think this notion that we're in a volatile environment is not true. It's just that most people who are investing capital, truthfully, weren't investing pre the financial crisis. Uh, and they weren't around for 01. And I, I mean, I hate to show all of our ages, but <laughs> I was around for 87 and 90 and 98 and 01 and 08, right? Like, so like, this is not a volatile environment. It's just not. This yeah. is a positive environment. We look much younger than we are. <laughs> we've, all, we've all done an age check before we came out, and we're too polite. Um, so uh, you've lived through a lot. Are you, worried about, are you worried about debt? I cover this on a daily basis, going, a trillion dollars in the United States of America. Debt is a big concern. Is there going to be a Minsky moment over, over, over U.S. debt? You know, if I knew that, I wouldn't be sitting here telling you. Would you think it's a gray swan? <laughs> You know, I, listen, I don't, I, don't, I don't see any reason why, you know, if you look at the total debt balances, why at some point it will clearly have to be reined in. You know, but I think right now if you look at the value of all the underlying relative to the amount of debt, mm -hmm. I think you feel okay. You know, they're clearly manufacturing a trillion of it right now this year. And ultimately, you would imagine that that's not sustainable. You know, but does it worry you right now? I think right now, you also look at one of the nice things to see, if you're in our seats generally, is when volatility really picks up, the 10-year trades down. <coughs> so you know, when, the, when volatility is at its highest, the government borrows cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So you know, given that philosophy, and then there's a, to me, there's a question really as to you know, should cash even generate an interest rate, right? So the people were living on a period of time where cash was earning interest rates of six, seven, eight, nine yeah. percent. You know, why does cash earn that interest rate, right? Cash, your value of cash is that it's fungible into other assets, right? Why should it sit there and earn? So when you look at the yield curve 30 years ago, you know, because the spreads kind of have remained a little bit the same, but obviously the absolute level of rates have changed dramatically. But I just always wonder, you know, will we ever be in an environment where cash is earning six or seven percent? I mean, there were asset management businesses that managed cash and traded it 12 and 13 times EBITDA for managing cash accounts, which to me just is insane. Those were the days. But, but I was just, like, just, to ju just to jump in on this, like the, the U.S. has 0.8 times debt to GDP. It's about a $20 trillion economy. It's got about $20 trillion in debt. It's going up a couple percent a year. Yeah. The real issue is, is ultimately the entitlements in the U.S., right, where you've got three to four times. The, if you look at the Medicare and Medicaid and the Social Security system and you were to count that as debt, you know, then you'd have, you know, 60 to 80 trillion of debt. And then that look, starts to look scary. But I think the reality of the market, and we're a public company, is that 
people have literally a one week, one month, quarterly attention span. And so eventually, the US, yeah. the, the, the math doesn't work around entitlements. The baby boomers are getting older. It just doesn't work. There's going to have to be entitlement restructuring. And the way the US government works is that it, all, it makes the right decision when there's no other choice. And so no one wants to talk about this. But eventually, the fixed income markets will discipline the US. There'll be a tipping point. The bond market will get freaked out. Uh, interest rates will go up. And then the, ultimately, the US will deal with a very tough issue, which is taking benefits that they've promised to older people away because it, the U.S. can't afford it, raising taxes, um, cutting spending. And so eventually there will be this moment, but I think you're years off from it, and it's not something that the market's focused on. Well, and I don't think they'll take them away. I think they'll grandfather things down. I mean, when Social Security was set, you know, the average age, uh, you know, life expectancy was shorter than Social Security yes. age. So I think you're going to have to have a mark to market that you know, takes that relative back to you know, where it was when it was originally established. Okay, Mike jump in and then I want to just Back to where we started, you asked me about cryptocurrencies. One of the real reasons everybody, everybody should have 1% of their portfolio in Bitcoin <laughs> are these reasons. You'll get to say it again tomorrow Buy morning. Bitcoin. On Bitcoin. Say it Buy again. Bitcoin. Buy Bitcoin. 5%. I mean, Buy Bitcoin. It, 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 you know, as Bitcoin is becoming a, a digital gold, really the only yes. crypto that has value just because it does, um, it is the hedge against these Minsky moments. If, if the shit hits the fan in, in yield curves, and so people say, oh, the stock market goes down, and that's not going to make Bitcoin go up. But if we start having a real financial crisis, a breakdown in trust in government securities, then it's going to skyrocket because it really is hard money. And, you know, it, you could also buy gold, but it's, it's, it's going to replace gold. And what we're seeing with big institutions now, from Fidelity to the New York Stock Exchange, is the architecture for rich guys and rich institutions to safely store money uh, in Bitcoin is being built. And so the, the, the two big custody uh, solutions are going to get turned on in the next two months. They got delayed a little bit because the government got shut down. And I would tell you by June of this year, you'll see institutions, Canadian pension funds and others, start accumulating small amounts of Bitcoin. And so to me, it seems like a no-brainer to have some portion of your portfolio in, in, in Bitcoin. Can you save a couple of news lines for the interview tomorrow? Just save on. I'm going to save a couple because those. Just they, save. You, you know, this, this is what happens. You put them on a platform, and they go, "Amanda, we're talking about debt. We'll come back to the cryptocurrency in a moment." But when you and I talked about the China uh, issue, the slowdown in China and trade wars, you said actually, man, it's, it, 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 it's about remimbi. It's a, it, it's about the relationship of the world to the currency, and you said that's the prism perhaps through which you're looking at trade wars? Well, I mean, obviously because of London and we're trying to, I mean, we were based here almost exclusively and we've recently moved back to London. Yeah. More. So obviously Brexit's a key issue. And, and we've, you know, we opened an office in China a few years ago, very small satellite office. And we visit, we, we're, you know, very bullish on Asia. And uh, we think that there are certain tools that doesn't matter what happens with in Brexit, uh, London will remain, you know, a key hub for RMB trading. And, uh, so, you know, I'm not a currency specialist, but, you know, that's something that, you know, and, and other regional currency, you know, other currencies here that, you know, London has found a, a good home. We're, we're backers of London, so, <laughs> as a financial hub, so. And, and in terms of the debt question, in terms of the, the, the debt concerns that, that aren't that prescient in the market at the moment, how does it play out in your thinking with investors? Well, I mean, I, I agree that at, at, at the yield, you know, uh, um, Josh was talking about inverted yield curve. I yes. mean, there's some, um, we, we like debt because when we were private equity investors, we're on the equity side, we, we're moving more and more. There's some really good opportunities uh, uh, in, at a different mid-level in the capital structure. So it, it depends what you're looking for. If you're looking for good returns, you know, that's, you know, uh, and you're prepared to take a bit more risk. Uh, and and you, you can go into that. So I, I think that's yeah, something from a private our point of view, it's quite important. How do investors, we'll come to you on, on, on the Bitcoin, or, or on the cryptocurrency in just a moment. From, from, the, from the other side of the market, how, how do the investors that you speak to looking at cryptocurrencies, Mike's at that precipitous <coughs> moment of where there are major institutions which are going to set up trading desks, which are going to get involved in clearing. The SEC is talking about the ETFs. Please save one line of news for me for tomorrow morning. How do you look at cryptocurrencies 
um, versus what Mike has just said? You know, I don't really look at them. Um, I'm not one that really has a strong view. Yep. I worked really hard for my dollars, and I like my dollars, and I just have a hard time trading them for Bitcoin. Okay. Can I can I just say the institutional the institutional market, Bitcoin is not an institutional, it's not an institutional product yet. Okay. There are very few there are very few customers or institutions that are significantly invest in Bitcoin. It may vary what there is. And I mean, I'd love to hear from Mike in terms of like, because I agree with you, but there's all this, trans, you know, the transparency and the security so, so, issues so is what's only David, back. David Swinson at Yale, who's maybe the most influential endowment investor, made a major investment in, in Bitcoin and in, 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 in a venture fund, you know, which is Bitcoin based, as did Stanford, as did Harvard. And so the institutions are starting to move in. They have started by putting it in their venture bucket, even though these our venture funds based in Bitcoin. Um, and so you're starting to see the progress. I would tell you if we saw 500 institutions, 50% aren't looking at it, 30% are doing a little bit of work and 20% are really focused. And so you're, but they're not there yet. I'm not arguing they are there. What is more interesting in some ways, you know, this cryptocurrency has a lot of different pieces to it. Tokenization is coming. So Fidelity started a, custody business, not because Abby Johnson thinks the whole world is going to buy Bitcoin, mm -hmm. but because she realizes that we're going to tokenize lots of the, the assets. So Todd's got a business in, in triple net lease, right? These private pools of, of leases. We're working on tokenizing a billion dollar triple net lease portfolio. And all that really means is you're going to start seeing lots of assets with a new wrapper on it. It's going to have a token, which is maybe a call on liquidity in a year, uh, once in seasons and easier transferability in the future. So something to pay attention to is that the tokenization of the private placement market. You think about it, the public equity market is about $2 trillion a year, and the private placement market is two and a half to $3 trillion a year. Some portion of that private placement market, if it's LP interest in your funds or, 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 or triple net lease portfolios, is going to be tokenized. And that's a lot of the reason a lot of the architecture of this stuff is getting built. How do you look, how do you look at cryptocurrencies, Amanda, at all? Does it come up in conversations with, with your investors, or how are you attacking it not, at all? Not with my investors, but with my husband. Who, who, uh, so he's got the family savings, and he's putting it all <laughs> no, he was like, no, he, he, he's quite a cryptocurrency man. I think he's a big fan. I'm a bit more nervous. Why? because I don't understand it, and, and the market's not transparent yet, and I just don't, and that's my, you know, I just don't understand it, so I don't ever buy or, or, or but I do think that, you know, in time, uh, you know, we were talking earlier this morning about, you know, the Islamic market, and, and all markets need to be deeper and, and more transparent, and that will, will bring some, um, I, I'll start looking at it then, but okay. I wouldn't invest personally, but that doesn't say I wouldn't recommend Keep it Keep an eye on the husband's bank. Go account. with the professionals. <laughs> Go to the one of the professionals. Mike, open this lady a new account. Um, in, in terms of trying to take it back to China and for the investment community that's in front of us here, I just want to go down the line in terms of, let's assume an optimistic outcome, whether it's kicking the can down the road, but Donald Trump manages to agree a new form of trade relationship with Xi Jinping. There will be major opportunities, one could say, if a peace breaks out. To that end, where's the biggest opportunity, uh, Josh, if there is some kind of resolution? Are there opportunities to come from a resolution in China for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the, ultimately the trade, there's going to be various um, trade deals that come out of it, whether it be for Boeing or for other U.S. products. But I think the real... The real positive is going to be ultimately the, you know, putting back 50 or 100 basis points of GDP in China, creating a little bit of momentum in our stock market, in China's market. Um, I don't think that the, the, the trade war so far hasn't been tremendously impactful on the U.S. And it, it's been, so, it's, so it's not, when we look down our portfolio, we have 55 companies, maybe one or two of them have been marginally affected by it. It's about... 0.1% of US GDP, uh, but what it's done is kind of created a 20% downdraft in the Chinese stock market, and it caused a lot of, you know, it caused a bunch of, you know, what we saw in December, and so I think it's a lot more about confidence and stock market valuation and confident consumer confidence and purchasing manager confidence. I don't think there's any, 
I don't see a specific, I don't think China is China's gonna change the way it does business. I think where you, what you're gonna get is um, a lot of orders, a lot of orders from US companies. I think you'll get that, um, and I think that's how China, I think the negotiation between the Trump administration and the Chinese is about, okay, we don't, we're not gonna change the way our company, country operates uh, in terms of you know, being centralized yeah. and the way we handle technology, but what we'll do is buy a lot of American goods and we'll lower barriers, and so I think that's the deal. The deal is gonna be economic flow to the US in exchange for the US backing off this whole technology thing, and I think that's how it will get done. Mike, I know you want to buy Chinese stocks, but what, what are the other opportunities? Well, let me give you a little nuance on this trade war. I do think we're going to end up coming to a solution in the trade war because it's politically expedient for both guys. That said, deeper than the trade war, I think, is a tech war. And that, I think, yeah. it's going to be a much more protracted and drawn-out gig. Yeah. You know, Donald Trump hit on something really important, uh, and you know, I rarely say nice things about Donald Trump, but I think on this Chinese trade, he said something that people weren't willing to say. He said, we're sick of being you know, cheated on, our, our IP stolen, and bipartisan agreement on that. And so even if the Democrats win, they're, they're not gonna back down on that. What the Trump administration is doing, though, goes one step further, right? It's not, we want fair trade, it's, we wanna win, and so, Inside the defense community uh, around you know, the Trump administration, there's a real idea of what can we do to beat them as opposed to be fair. It's a very new mindset, one that I hadn't seen my whole you know, investing political career. Um, and so I think you gotta watch that really carefully. Uh, harder to get visas for Chinese kids, uh, harder to hire them, real difficulty in tech transfer. So company by company, it makes for specific uh, differences. We can't even get deals approved. Like it's almost, when we now look at our companies, you know, the ability to get um, transactions approved in both countries mm -hmm. is complicated. So I, I agree with Mike, but I, and I think it's, I actually think it's a little risky, this strategy of beating the Chinese, because I think that, um, they're, they're very powerful in the world, and I think the two countries getting along will be really beneficial. And you know, you got to be c careful about releasing this animal spirit in the U.S. That uh, the Chinese are bad, the Chinese are unfair. You have to be very careful with that. Todd, the biggest opportunity, if, if we get a, if we get a, a reasoning of minds. I agree with, with what Josh says, that they're going to buy our goods. They're going to buy our goods to drive down the, 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 uh, the deficit. And I think that's going to be really good for American business generally. And I think it's going to add to GDP. And, you know, I think that that would probably then cause the, the, the credit markets to continue to get tighter and the equity markets to go up. And so I think, you know, that would just be a, a good trade to have risk on when that happens. Okay. We've got 12 minutes, 33 seconds. Are we taking Q&A in this, in this? Okay, so uh, anybody feel inspired? If we, get, if we get lots of questions, you get less of me. There's an opportunity for you. Uh, so we're gonna hand around the mic, have a think of questions. We've got 12 minutes, 29, 19 seconds. We're gonna do tech and sport, and we're gonna do a very fast round robin. Amanda, the moment that you came to life on that phone last night was really, you could hear a discernible change of tone in your voice when we got to, when we got to sports buying businesses in sport, and I want you to tie it together with tech. I, I want you to tell me why. Why do I want to invest in sports? Where are the opportunities in that business at the moment? Well, I mean, we, we're, um, obviously we're quite um, big football fans in our family, uh, as both fans and, uh, and investors. Uh, we've been looking at buying assets in the Premier League for some time. The difficulty is, though, the valuations there are totally different. I mean, you, you, as a private equity investor, you're looking at quite moderate valuations, and then suddenly you're, you're getting uh, um, advisors saying, you know, uh, some of the big Premier League teams are now trading at four, five times revenue, uh, which is uh, heavy. But we do believe very much in investing in sport. It's, it's the one um, live, you know, investing in live content is important for us. Uh, I mean, the, the guys on the panel have, uh, have real assets to play with. Um, we know it's, uh, we've looked at pretty much every Premier League team at the moment, and um, we think the Premier League is, is still a, a very exciting place to invest.
Will we see a deal from you soon? Oh, I don't know. We'll see. I hope. So uh, she's on TV tomorrow morning. Don't worry. Yeah. We push her a little bit harder than tomorrow let, morning. Let me, let me take a crack at it. So the globalization of media. So basically, people want to watch the best sports in the world. And it used to be that you couldn't um, watch those sports. You, the, the NBA is now more popular in China than it is in the US. There are more people watching NBA games. So as the media audience globalizes, um, and Amanda's right that um, live content is the two things that drive, you know, viewership are news and new, news and sports. You can't, you can't, you can't get it on Netflix. You can't get it on Amazon. You got to watch it live because you know the score at the end. So, the, because there's these global audiences watching sports, you're seeing a massive uplift uh, in media dollars that are driving. That's a huge tailwind for sports, for particularly the best sports in the world, which are MLB, NFL. NBA, the Premier League, and a few teams in Europe, and the NHL, the National Hockey League. Um, the only issue with the Premier League, as I've found out, is they have this tiny thing called relegation, <laughs> which if you're not in the big six, means that unlike the US leagues, um, if you finish in the bottom three, you get to pay most of your player salaries, but you lose all your revenue. So the media payment goes down by you know, 50% and it end, ends up being about 5% of what you used to get. And so uh, it's that particular thing in, in, in the Premier League. Yeah, it was a little detail that we, uh, we found out about. <laughs> you know but, what, um, if, you have a, if you have a chat with Amanda after, she, she, she'll have <laughs> That little thing actually does constrain the value, although it makes it very exciting for fans to watch, and, which is the real point of it. Yeah, we're writing relegation insurance now. So, you know, we're starting to figure out, is there a way to be doing that? Buy that? Will, you, yeah. will you give her a discount? <laughs> yeah, if we... I mean, we have to figure out, there's a lot of <laughs> terms to work out, right? And you have to be competitive and be willing to spend can you, payroll. Can you backdate some for Josh? Yeah, we'll <laughs> talk yeah. after. <laughs> talk after. We're 13th. We don't, Amanda, we don't jump in. It. And Mike, if you've got a comment, then if you've got a microphone, you've got there Amanda and then Mike. But I'd like to say about the relegation thing, you know, that's why the premiership is, good, you know, it's good viewing. Yeah, and we think it yeah. should mean that premiership teams are cheaper, but yeah. that's our view. And I've been talking to a lot of American owners and they're saying, you know, everybody gets a prize. That everybody going home with a prize is, yeah, it's probably de-risked, but it's also not quite as fun. Um, so we'll see. But I, I appreciate your comments and knowing where you've been, you know, you're well done and uh, well done for getting there. Todd, is there a good margin in that relegation insurance business? Well, we're still pricing it all out. You know, so, but, but ultimately, you know, we think, you know, sports generally, I mean, when, when we, we bought uh, Let Around for DraftKings, when DraftKings and was trying to ma merge with FanDuel, and we started to believe that the merger wasn't going to go through, so we decided that we wanted to do a special security for DraftKings and built a security that was at the top of the capital structure, but acted as if it was also an equity security. And, now DraftKings is in a really good spot because the gambling became legal. Sports gambling became legal in the U.S. and they're now running New Jersey books and they have 70% of the New Jersey market and they already have the interface. So, you know, and we believe very much that sports gambling, you know, is going to continue to drive engagement with content and that's going to continue to create more value for the underlying IP and agree very much with Josh that the top sports in the world are going to continue to go up in value. We've just opened a Dodger training facility in Uganda. So now we're thinking, you know, where are we going to go next? And we're looking at Kenya. So we're shipping gear, old gear and old equipment and Dodger jerseys and we're holding camps. And you know, one of the things the, the, the football business has done very well, the soccer business, the football business has done very well, is the player development all around the world. And you know, there's a whole business to be run around developing players. When you make it legal, it takes some of the fun away. Um, okay, who's got the, who's got, oh, there's a lady. Can you say who you are and your question? And okay, Cornelia Maya, Maya Resources. From that upbeat note, I would like to sort of go a little bit more depressed again. Now, if and when we have a next big downturn, which at some stage will come, whether it's 2020 or 2025, where is the cal cavalry that will come to the rescue? You, we know we had governments cooperating. We have highly levered governments now. We have inter interest rate lever is all but gone. So gone. But so where will the where will where will the concerted effort to dampen the blow come from? Okay, Mary Daly from well, from the San Francisco it, Fed said said it would be QE and perpetuum. Let's take it to you uh, first of all, uh, Joshua, please. 
Yeah, look, I think you raise a good point. I mean, I think like there's been a lot of depletion of the arsenal. Um, but, um, you know, at the same time, um, you know, certainly what saved the world and the U.S. in the financial crisis was the, you know, the, the, the Treasury and the Fed guaranteed 28 trillion of securities. And so, like, at the end of the day, right, it's, it's going to have to be the U.S. government, the Chinese government, the EC. That's the only cavalry there is. So, but having said that, you're right. A lot of the, a lot of the, um, you know, the bullets that people had have been spent. It's going to be much harder. But they, they've rebuilt the arsenal to a degree, right? Rates are at 2%, so you've got yeah. eight rate cuts if you wanted to go 25 at a, yeah. at a shot. So it's not Fair. like we're at zero anymore. You've, you've, re, you've re rebuilt some, some arsenal there, and you still have QE you could turn back on. And so I don't think the Fed sits there worried. I think it's an interesting Fair. conversation that, that the San Francisco Fed did bring up the other day in terms of making QE part of the sort of the, the pro forma for resolution toward uh, response to Cornelia? I agree with everything that was said. Okay, Grant. Do we have another question over here? Sir, your name, uh, where are you from, your question? Uh, Tim Gosher, CEO of Dolma Impact Fund. We're a private equity investor in frontier markets. <coughs> and I wondered, given that markets are perhaps baking in the end of a cycle, whether that's pushing perhaps private equity or other investors more into, obviously these are complex deals, high risk, I'm, current, I'm British, I'm currently telling my British LPs that I'm offering them a safe haven from Brexit. Mm. Might work. Amanda, that's very you. Safe haven from, well, well done there, that, that's, that's, that's really good. <laughs> um, so he said he was got impact fund. And, and, and impact, just say the Can name you of your fund again. It's a private, equ private equity fund based in the UK. And you're based in the UK? Dol Dolma Impact Fund, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, well, I think, um, is the UK really a haven? In, in, no, in, I, I think I think it, Brexit's going to. Oh my God, we didn't talk about this. Is it going to happen? Yeah, probably. Um, I think the UK offers huge opportunity. Um, I think that there's going to be some difficulties, but we just got to. You okay. know, Can I ask you, uh, in a Brexit moment, if we, if and when, if and when we Brexit, are you looking more closely at UK assets at the moment? Are we? Very, very briefly. Yeah, I mean, I'd say, look, we're, we, I think we think that Brexit is not, li there's not like, the, there's not, it's not likely to be a hard Brexit. So I think we're looking at either, a, you know, they pull back or there's some declaration of something that looks like a very soft Brexit. In a very soft Brexit, it doesn't really impact the economy all that much. So I think certainly, I mean, we have uh, a number of deals, some of which are in the press, you know, that, um, you know, we're doing and looking at. And so it's not really scaring us away from the UK. We're just factoring in. I think what has happened in the UK is they've slowed down growth. Uh, yes. But the, the devaluation of the pound is not kind of mostly offset, you know, the, the sort of Brexit effect on the UK. So it's, it's a muted effect. C could I ask a gentleman? Yes, of course. Are your LPs um, you, cre uh, dollar investors? They are, they are dollar investors and the Brexit bit was a joke. I mean, the, the question is, are in investors likely to look at frontier markets, more risky markets, yes, emerging definitely. markets, to absolutely. decouple themselves? Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. I think so. Very much so at the moment. Any more questions at the back? The lights are quite harsh here on the top. Hi. Sir? Uh, Yusuf Kutsi from Oak Tree Capital, though my, my question is more for, driven from a personal interest than uh, professional. But thank you for the discussion on uh, sports investing. Uh, is there any view on the panel about esports? Uh, is anyone investing in it? And uh, you know, we, we, we read about the fantastic growth it's experiencing. Perhaps it's also very risky, but would love to hear your thoughts. Yes, yeah, so, so we own um, ten esports teams uh, through an entity called Dignitas. Um, it's there's clearly there are more people watching esports events, certain esports events like Overwatch. There was more viewership than the World Series, and so there's like and the, the reality is people like to watch sports that they played when they were younger. And there's no joke like a, like a half a trillion people yeah. playing esports around the world. So esports is definitely uh, a real. It's a, it's something that's real. It's here to stay. The issue is making money. Um, none of the leagues are well structured and the teams have all raised money at very high valuations that don't, and they're all losing money and so um, many of the flaws that exist in the existing leagues that have been fixed over time such as a lack of a cap on player salaries or um, 
you know, make it really difficult to buy an esports team and make money with it. So you're really creating a piece of art. And in many cases, sports teams do trade like that. There's no question that, the, that you, those people who have staying power and use other people's money will ultimately have a nice piece of art that they can sell to someone. But it's a hard thing as an economic matter to make sense of, particularly because you have the gaming companies that can change the rules and that have a whole different agenda versus the leagues where, which you're part of in a traditional sport. We own Cloud9, and Cloud9 is actually making money. And you know, we've got 19 different teams, and now they're getting, they just announced a very big sponsorship deal with Puma. We won the first Overwatch League championship with the London Spitfire. Uh, you know, the reality of it is, is that very few, well, it's a tiny fraction of the population that actually has a chance to be a professional athlete. And there's a massive portion of the population that can get very good at video games. And you know, as we're seeing these video games, and one of the things that you just saw uh, last weekend in Fortnite, Fortnite hosted a concert where Marshmallow came on at 2 p.m. Eastern time, and 10 million people watched a virtual concert in the middle of a Fortnite game where they gave you all the special powers. And my youngest son was up at 7 in the morning preparing for the Fortnite concert. So, you know, I think you're starting to see these themes. And what Fortnite's done that no one else has done is also made it into a social game. So you're on the device playing the game with your headset on, communicating with your friends all around the country and the world. You know, it's such an interesting phenomenon. And I think if you saw what Netflix had to say on their most recent uh, press, uh, on, their, on their earnings report, they said we're more worried about Fortnite than we are worried about HBO and Showtime. And I think that's you know, a theme that we're going to continue to see. I think video gaming year over year was up 20% in terms of minutes played. So I just don't think that's going away. Mike, any comments? You know, it's one of our biggest investment themes on the crypto side is investing in game studios, virtual world. We have investment in a company called High Fidelity, which literally you live in a virtual world. You can get your avatar done for 100 bucks, and then your avatar moves around. Uh, mine is my 26-year-old self. <laughs> Channel your inner, your inner self. Um, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, a, a big thank you to Mr. Milken for inviting us here, putting this together, bringing this panel together. It's always an honor to be invited to, to moderate. Uh, and a great panel you were to Mike Novogratz, Joshua Harris, Amanda Stavely, Todd, Todd Bailey, uh, Bowley, excuse me. No uh, and you can see two of them tomorrow on Bloomberg. Not CNBC, Bloomberg. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.